If you're interested in learning to trade on Betfair, then visit the Bet Angel Academy, where you have detailed, structured Betfair trading courses. Or why not visit our website where you can download a free trial of Bet Angel Professional, but also visit the forum where you can get detailed images, examples, and downloadable files. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon if you want notification of new videos as they're released. So once again, thank you for all the questions that I got on the recent Q&A. There were a lot of them. Um, some of them I can answer, some I can't. Um, but the purpose of this video is to go through some of those questions and have a look at some of the answers uh, that I can give you sort of immediately off the top of my head without detailed explanations. Um, and as I've said before, some of them, what we're going to do is we're going to probably produce videos specifically around individual topics. Um, Darren, and I have replied to this with a message, said, um, I often find hidden clues in your videos. Yes, you do. And that is because I deliberately put some in there. Um, it's good that people have noticed it. Um, it's really for people who want to think a bit deeper or want to understand uh, the markets in greater depth. So there, there's stuff that I sort of consider um, not standard um, or, yes, I'm trying to find a word for it. I don't know what, what the word is for it, but yeah, I'll, I'll drop little hints in now and again or do little things um, that should give you a deeper insight if, it's, if you really want to go that deep. Uh, what is the typical price behavior of a pre-race based on 10 runners? Not totally sure I understand what that question is. If you go back on to the video and elaborate, then I can probably give you an answer. But if you look at typical price behavior, you know, one of the things um, that you may or may not be aware of is that on average, um, the most likely finish price of of the odds um, is the starting price. I know that sounds odd, but if you look five to ten minutes out and something's priced at four and you plot a bell curve, a, a, a distribution of where it ends up, then the most frequent um, occurrence is for it to end up exactly where it started. And then obviously the bell curve spreads out on either side from there. Um, the number of runners, smaller fields are slightly more volatile than bigger fields, um, but very often um, there are other mitigating factors within there. It's, that's an almost impossible question to answer without any more detail. Jeff, hello Jeff, says, um, how can you tell if you're answering a, a, a market at value price? I'm not really looking for value most of the time. Um, the market itself very often is inefficient. The, the prices go all over the place for no real valid reason at all. Um, I remember really well, I think it was last year, there was a race at Goodwood that was a group race. The two horses um, were perfectly suited to the cost and distance. The uh, rating of the horses was exactly the same. They'd won last time out um, on similar ground. And basically, to all intents and purposes, these were exactly the same horses that should have been rated exactly the same way. But you should have seen the market. Absolutely, completely bonkers. So I'm not particularly looking at a a particular value price. I'm just looking for extremes where the market's obviously completely lost its marbles um, and that then the price has to correct at some point. And I say has, obviously it may not, um, but you tend to get a feeling for that very easily. There's no way that a horse that was at sixes can go off at 101. So naturally there have, have to be points at which it will be backed no further. But when you look at um, drifting prices, if the horse is loose and then charges through a fence, you know, that's going to go on for a long time. So I'm normally looking at extremes, unless if there's a mitigating factor as to, to why it should continue uh, its current trend. Uh, would you regard Greyhound Racing as one of the toughest nuts to crack? I, um, I, I automate some of the Greyhound Racing that I do. I say, I say some, pretty much all of it. Every now and again during the winter, I'll dive into Greyhound Racing and... Um, have a good look at the, the greyhounds and try and understand um, if there's stuff to be done on there. But the because the market turnover is so small, sort of maybe 15,000 per market, it's just not big enough for me to spend much time on. So I tend to put my bots on it most of the time. And, um, am I, and it says in here, am I selective on certain tracks and time of the day when you enter the races? Yeah, you've got afternoon bags meetings that have high liquidity. The open races in the evening are much, much higher liquidity. 
Um, and they often produce uncompetitive races that have very different ca characteristics to the afternoon bags meetings. So they um, are very uh, different depending upon, you know, so if you're just trying to find one strategy that works on all those different races, the morning card, the afternoon and the evening, you're probably better off splitting it um, onto individual sessions and different types of races. Um, what tool to use in this workshop? Um, if my strategy is modelly consistent, and common, uh, what uh, tools shall I use? In, the problem that you have is there is no answer to that because um, for every market there's a strategy and every strategy a market and your role as a trader is to go in and apply the right tool um, to the right market. So that's what your job is basically. All the strategies that we have within the product work really well but only when applied to the right market at the right time. So that's part of the skill of trading, is um, identifying markets where situations are likely to be more favourable. If you look at Dutching, I did a video on Dutching, indicating the markets where that tends to work the better. Um, so you may want to have a look at that particular video. Uh, people talk about the importance of prize money in certain events. Could you explain how does that prize money in a race reflect in the trading volume? A very short answer to this is basically the higher quality the event, uh, the more prize money there will be and therefore there will be more betting focus on that race and that will drive volume. So if you look at Cheltenham at Ascot, um, at Champions Day at Ascot and all of those big meetings, I absolutely love those because the prize money is very big and therefore um, that's going to drive liquidity and when there's lots of money in the market then I can do bigger trades. So that's why I tend to like those. Um, and it sort of says here is uh, the market is much more stable. You tend to find that the market's more certain. When you get a very, very big race, the market's more certain that it knows what the price should be and there's less variability within the market. Um, the problem that you have is most people know that and therefore there's more money. So it doesn't improve the quality of the market because it takes longer to get matched. If you can get an order in and out of the market really quickly, that's the lowest risk that you'll take. But when you trade a bigger race where the markets are more stable, the order queue is massive and therefore you can't get your order through quickly, so the risk goes up. So you don't win whichever way you do it. It's, um, it's unfortunate. You go for lower quality races, you get your order filled really quickly, but the market's much more volatile. So, you know, swings and roundabouts really uh, in, in the scheme of things. Do, do, do. Um, a list of different variables. There are so many. Uh, this is uh, the I'm looking here. Can you list the uh, list of variables that affect price order? There. If you look through all the videos that I've done over the years, um, I very often break down individual components in individual videos. So I did a video called Trading the Bounce, which is basically the end of the market, and then other videos I've done a little bit earlier. Some are during the high liquidity periods, um, but it changes depending upon what position you are in the, in the market. That'd be quite a difficult video to produce. If, if I run courses or try and give people advice, um, it takes me all day to explain uh, all of the things that influence the outcome of the market. But the fact is, is you're looking at a whole range of different variables, but they're not all equally applied. Uh, they apply in some markets, not in others, and some are strong characteristics, characteristics and some are weaker. But if you look at all the videos I've ever produced, yeah, each one of those tends to focus on one of those aspects. Sometimes you may combine two or three in one go. Jeff, hello, hello again, Jeff, says, uh, when swing trading, do you wait for the previous trend to end before entering the market to predict the end of the trend before it happens? Um, uh, if, you, if you're trading effectively, you should always be anticipating price action, um, whether it's short, long, or however you want to do it. But i give you a scenario here. If I see something's being backed in very heavily, then I will look for evidence that it's going to continue to be backed in heavily. But at the same time, I'll be looking... Um, at where I think it could bounce, where I think um, the opportunity for uh, the market to start to stall will be. And if I'm sort of near that point, um, and some of this is dependent upon how much time I've got to trade, then I'll start looking for, a, for an opposing trend. So I'm looking for the exhaustion of the backing. However, sometimes it's really easy to see uh, that something is going to be continuously backed endlessly because you, you look at the market, you see a big chunk of money come in, and then the price probably just moves back a bit, and meanders around, and then another big chunk comes, and then it me and then another big chunk, and it's it. I describe it like that because that's what it feels like. You're, you're busy trading, you're looking at it, and there's boom, there's a boom, 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 and you can sense that money flooding through the market. 
But I would say, apart from an exceptional circumstances, that generally everything has a flaw. There's a price at which it will not want to really go um, that much. So if I'm in a market that's trending heavily, I will place closing orders somewhere near where I think it will start to stall because I'd prefer to be at the front of the queue to get out of the market as quickly as I can uh, when that occurs. Um, Charles Peter says, do you tend to concentrate on quantitative football trading rather than one match at a time? I think uh, what you're trying to say there is, do you do many or one? Um, so I, I do tend to do more than one, um, but you tend to find you trade less effectively if you do that. So there'll be a match that I prefer to watch, um, and then I will... Uh, you know, do whatever I'm trying to do as a broad strategy, as a broad strategy, as a narrow strategy, right in that particular market. So if I watch a match, um, I can read the match quite well. I can tell what the ebb and flow is, whether I think there's more likely to be a goal and, and how the match is shaping up. So there was a good example, which maybe I need to put up on a video. Um, when I was watching Southampton, obviously I know the Southampton team really well and the strengths and weaknesses of individual players. Um, but I could tell when they took an early lead that they were not going to hold on to that for a number of reasons. So when you look at a match intensity like that, um, that that's a good way to trade it. But the problem you've got is a goal could go in at any point for any reason. You do all of your research, you understand it really well, and then some guy just makes a horrific mistake and the ball's in the back of the net. So for that reason, I prefer to deploy a number of strategies across the range of markets. I like the Europa League and the Champions League group stages simply for the fact that you can aggregate your risk across many markets. So I, I quite like to do that, but I'm, I'm most effective over the long term at trading uh, one individual match where I can watch the match and understand exactly what's going on within that match and anticipate stuff that's likely to happen. Uh, Jeff says, what role does mean reversion play in trading. It's funny, I, I misread that. I thought, I thought it was said mean reversion in play trading. So, so I suddenly, whoop. Uh, generally, the market does uh, mean revert most of the time. Um, so I would describe the market uh, as uh, a, a process of mean reversion. And that would typically um, be the de facto way that the market tends to work. It's just that on the particular market in which you're on at that moment in time, it may not revert, but if you kept that market running for 20 minutes, you'd probably find that it would do. But not always, because um, obviously there are mitigating factors in terms of what's going on on course uh, that may influence that, that result. But in general, I would say yes, um, the market tends to mean revert. And just keeping an eye on the, the a race I want to trade is coming up in a second, so I may have to duck out. I'm just watching how long we've got before they go to post. Uh, I think I am okay at this moment in time. Uh, do you trade cricket if yes, uh, etc.? Um, I don't have time to trade cricket. I would like to trade cricket. I probably may trade it at some point in the future, but my hands are so full on other sports that I tend not to do it. And I know there's an opportunity there, and I know it's a fast-growing sport, and there are, and I know some really good cricket, cricket traders, um, but I haven't had the time to sit down and do it. And also, I have to quantify stuff. I need to know roughly what I'm doing. What impact is a wicket likely to have in a T20 match with X number of overs and X number of runs left? I need to be able to, to quantify that before I even attempt to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's still a little bit um, off at the moment. Uh, Jeff again. How many is that, Jeff? Is that three or four? <laughs> the um, yes, scalping to a profitable. I go back to my mantra, which is for every market there's a strategy, every strategy a market. So... Um, scalping always has been profitable. It was profitable in more markets 20 years ago than it is today. Um, but yeah, it's just a question of market selection. You have to decide where you want um, to deploy that strategy. And that's what your role is as a trader. It's not a question as to whether it works or not, because yes, it does, but only given the right circumstances. Have you this? I like this question, Jason Busby here. Have you ever, did you ever back at 101 or lay at 1000? If so, what were the circumstances? Never, um, but I have done the opposite. So laying at 101, you will find that um, if you lay at 101, that's profitable, but everybody knows that, so everybody's there. Um, so by default, you can tell that backing at 101 is not uh, profitable. 
But one of the things I've noticed, and you may see me tweet this now and again, is um, when you look at the um, horses coming up to that last fence, I've actually modelled um, all of the individual courses, how many fences there are, and the likelihood of a fall at any one of those fences over certain distances and on different ground. And you can tell that if you could back at 110 or above as it was about to jump that last fence, then there's probably some, some value there. Uh, but backing at 101 um, in that particular market just makes no sense at all. You will lose money. So I'm amazed to always see people uh, backing at 101, uh, even before the horse has managed to clear the last fence. I don't think that's a particularly valid strategy. However, I have backed um, horses to win in running at 1,000. And um, you can sort of, during the jump season, this is a strategy that I will deploy. It's not something I'll do in the... It's funny, actually, I was going to say, it's not something I do in the flat season. However, I, my very ever first um, 1,000 that I managed to capture in play um, was because I had a bit of spare money floating around the market and I was experimenting with dutching the back of the book. And I happened to catch a horse. I remember it so well. I can tell you uh, the the race course and the name. It was a horse called Bermondsey Bod, 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 Bob, Bermondsey Bod, at Salisbury. And um, I remember experimenting with this process of taking some profit and spreading it around the back of the book to try and find some value. And I happened to capture uh, odds of a thousand. And I have done that fairly frequently. Although typically it's something that would tend to happen during the jump season. So you imagine you've got a short priced. Um, favorite uh, and it falls at a jump of some sort um, and then things at much much bigger prices have the opportunity uh, to come into much much shorter prices um, and they and the faller may impede other runners as well so if you get lots of fallers or other things that happen you could have one of those big moments um, in a jumps race where you land something at very very large odds so yeah um I, I wouldn't do what you suggest there, which is back at 101 or lay out 1,000. You know, that said, if, if you're trying to hedge out a position um, where you've got spare money um, in a market, such as, for example, if I'm in a, uh, a multi-month market where some of the odds have moved to 1,000, I may just lay out 1,000 to get rid of liability um, and to, to free up the cash. But that's about the only time I'd do that. Generally, I'd do completely the opposite. Uh, Jeff says, a big fan of black shoals equation or black skulls, depending upon which way you want to pronounce it. Um, how does it apply to the betting exchange? Well, if you are into black shoals, you'll know it's all to do with volatility over time. Um, so that should hopefully answer your question. I'm just reading Darren's uh, question here, which is... Um, you mentioned psychology as trader, in, in particular prospect theory. Yep, uh, make sure you read up on that. Having started to read up on this, well done. <laughs> what I understand is that generally people hurt um, about losing five pound. They feel um, more, more the, about losing five pound than they do gaining it. Um, does this describe where you see uh, traders panic and exit trades? Uh, spot on. If you've been reading up on it, then hopefully you'll begin to understand and reach the conclusions that I did with it. And um, you see it right through the market, all of the things that are discussed um, about prospect theory and in those books um, and in the academic papers related to it that describe beautifully what you see in the market. For many years, couldn't understand what's going on in the market or why it didn't seem to make any sense uh, to me. Um, and prospect theory gave me the answers and related material around that area. Be careful when you, when you read up on this sort of stuff, because a lot of books are written to be sold. Um, they're not... Uh, written from an academic perspective so it's better and I know it's painful sometimes if you can read the academic reasoning behind it because it will give you a much deeper understanding don't buy books that say uh, interested in prospect theory buy this book and understand it in 10 minutes and apply it to your everyday life because they tend to summarize shortcut stuff and it, you don't get a full description uh, do you find there are more backers than layers in different markets um, you do. Um, you tend to find different markets attract different types of activity. Although, in essence, really, the market is always has to be in equilibrium because you need layers for every backer and so on. Um, so it's difficult to say there are more backers than layers in certain markets. But typically, you will find that um, 
obviously if there's an imbalance then it moves the price anyway so you can tell that there are more of one type in a market than in the others um, but there is a propensity for people and it's sort of in relation to the question above there is a propensity for people to want to back because um, if you put down 10 to win 100 in a, in a market at 10 to 1 people will love that and they will back that until the cows come home but if you say to them you could win a tenner by laying a hundred people will be nervous because of the the risk associated with that so you tend to find that there's an imbalance what i should do is a video on this because there's a, a brilliant way that you can show this in real life um and the the impact of of what you see in this sort of uh, scenario so maybe i should do a video about that um Ruben Vaughan here asked a question similar to one that um, was a, a little bit further up. So I think I've probably covered that to some extent. Um, probably one aspect of this question is, are there common dead ends that people tend to go down that waste time and drain enthusiasm? I'd say probably, um, it's funny, I was going to say watching YouTube videos. No, um, people get obsessed with thinking that there's some uh, magical process somewhere when in fact uh, it's better that you just spend your time and effort getting screen time and getting familiar with the way that the market works. I'd say probably the most important thing is to understand the trading process properly because if you don't understand the trading process properly um, then you can fall into the trap of not getting anything else right. So you have to get used to that process of putting an order in, taking an order out and managing that position and then you can start to get clever. What probably wastes most people's time um, uh, buying some brand new system or trying some generic strategy um, that has been given to them or you know you see you see many systems appear and concepts appear so like scalping sort of is is a nice little strategy but it gets overused and misused regularly um, and then people will write entire books about it and produce individual components of about scalping um, that bear no relevance to how it should be used in the market. So it's more important that you put strategies to use in the market and learn them rather than think that there's some sort of element of shortcutting or that there is a definitely a right or wrong way to do it. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, um, every market has a strategy. So your role as a trader is to identify what you should be doing in that market. To start with, you're only going to know that after the market's finished. But over time, your objective is to understand it better and better so that you can anticipate it. Uh, Matt's PC says, um, I'm assuming you're familiar with Dixon's Curls paper in 1997. So I was wondering if you ever implemented this yourself and whether it's profitable. No. Um, I, I started working on football matches in the mid 80s. So I did a Dixon's Coal before Dixon's Coal did. Um, I went back to the library, brushed up on my maths, started to uh, work through all of the concepts and stuff. Um, but obviously, a lot of water has passed under the bridge from there. So there is so many different, again, I think this almost needs a separate video on it really because modeling football matches is something I do all of the time and I, I enjoy the challenge of that. Uh, if you're not part of our Super Six League, check out the forum because you can compete against me on that if you want. Uh, and that's all to do with prediction. But um, I wouldn't use Dixon's Colts to attempt to make money. That's my short answer. It probably needs a much longer answer than that. This is a nice question. If this is day one of your trading career, what three things would you begin with? Um, an open mind, um, a reasonable trading bank, and a bit of software. <laughs> that, that, in all honesty, that is what I would start with. I think that um, you need to approach it without any prejudice, and you definitely need software. And I think that um, you, you also need to be able to approach it um, unprejudiced by anything that has gone before. Um, I, I, probably a better question would be where would I start it may be I, d I did do a video on my first year of Betfair trading which you may be interested in watching on that but I'm, I'm thinking that there may be a better answer in terms of um, you know what things do you need to really get going and how should you really get going I'm working on some stuff at the moment now that will probably release in the new, new year that will probably help people um, get started a bit quicker but less about that, you know, we, well, I'll talk about that at, the, at that particular moment in time. 
So I think uh, I've done about another half an hour or so um, of answers here. So probably time to um, shut this video off and I'll hopefully continue the others um, in another video fairly shortly. So yeah, thanks for those questions. Hopefully I've given you a few answers there that you can um, get something from. And uh, I'll record the remaining answer, uh, questions that we have on here on a separate video.